But first off, we do have a new edition of Better Know a Think Tank. All right, so today we are going to be speaking with Andrew Moyland, Executive Director and Senior Fellow at the R Street Institute. Not the R House <laughs> Institute. Right. Gotcha. Okay. I was just How, wondering because that was the song we played. Right. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> you like that walk-on music? That's perfect. <laughs> it's good. I'm glad I got music at all. <laughs> right. All right, so uh, like many of our audience already know, we uh, take this segment and we uh, to explore the different think tanks around the country. So again, we're going to be talking with R Street Institute. So first off, before we get into uh, one of your newest reports, why don't you just give us some background information on R Street Institute and uh, what you guys tend to work on? Yeah, so the R Street Institute is a relatively new free market think tank. We're based in Washington, D.C., uh, and actually most of our founding staff used to be former members of the Heartland Institute staff, and so we have some uh, kinship there to this day. And uh, our street is a, we call ourselves a, a pragmatic, uh, you know, libertarian-leaning organization. And so both of those sort of clauses there are important. The libertarian part sort of explains itself to folks who pay attention to politics, so we work on a lot of uh, tax and fiscal and regulatory issues and, uh, technology policy and privacy constitutional questions, uh, and, and come at it from a libertarian perspective. But we also have a very pragmatic orientation. Uh, and by that I mean that we try to do our best to secure, uh, policy wins wherever we can get them. And sometimes that means not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good and, and working on some, uh, more obscure issues. And so, um, you know, we uh, we do a fair amount of working in coalition with organizations that have very different ideological outlooks from us. Uh, that that defines a lot of what we do, and we've been growing a lot and expanding into new areas. And and most of what the core for us was initially were sort of insurance issues and and other kinds of regulatory questions. We've expanded out uh, outside of that into doing more work on energy. Uh, technology policy, as I mentioned, and now a big uh, issue is financial services for us, and um, in addition to our work on sort of governance and, and trying to uh, improve, you know, transparency and and, uh, and democratic dysfunction. So that's kind of a quick uh, overview and idea of what we do, and, and obviously one of the things we'll be talking about is some of our work on, on the sharing economy, which, uh, you know, is also a, a big feature of what we do. So just just to clarify, you guys are not actually located on our street. No. So we used to be <laughs> uh, we used to be on Connecticut and our street in Washington D.C. If anybody's been there, it's the Dupont Circle area uh, of D.C. and what was a uh, converted art studio, uh, you know, just a room with a bunch of us, and we quickly outgrew that space. We're now. Uh, I guess if we were going by street names, we would be the 17th Street Institute, but <laughs> I like it doesn't it. have quite the same ring to it. <laughs> yeah, see, the hardball questions come from John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so we actually were discussing our street, was it our last podcast or a podcast ago? Uh, you guys had a good report about the regulatory uh, budgeting, uh, about yeah. the ca test case in Canada. So that's kind of where we brought this up, and then I kind of checked back on your website and saw uh, your newest report on you're calling it, I guess, roomscore.org, which is similar. You also had a rideshare.org, which basically ranked all the, um, you know, how the, you know, getting a cab or an Uber or limo service, how big the regulatory burdens are into breaking into that field. Now, the room score one, that's more dedicated towards, like, hotel, Airbnb, and those types of things. So what's, what's kind of the background on this report, and what did you guys find? Yeah, so as you mentioned, this, this new report, we did both a, uh, you know, a paper that we wrote explaining a lot of the results and, uh, of the research that we've done. And then as you mentioned, the website, roomscore.org, which, uh, gives you a nice sort of, an easy way to actually interact with the results rather than having to wade through a big long paper. Uh, and so we map it out and, and show all the results and allow you to, you know, compare and click around. And basically the, the, where it came from, the idea for it was, as you mentioned, we had done a similar thing uh, in the realm of uh, for hire transportation services, and we did 
uh, a paper and a report and a you know website at ridescore.org um, where we took 50 of the top cities in the country and we tried to assess their regulatory climate uh, as to their openness to uh, for higher transportation services. So yes, that includes uh, obviously you know new transportation network companies, ride sharing services like Uber and Lyft and, and others. Um, but it also includes, of course, taxis and limos because that's a part of that for higher transportation market. And so we tried to grade uh, every city on a bunch of different metrics uh, there and, and come up with a scorecard. So we tried to basically recreate that same formula but do it for the world of short-term rental. Uh, and so, you know, you can think of Airbnb and HomeAway and Flipkey and VRBO and all these other services, even, you know, things like Craigslist, for that matter, uh, that have been popping up recently and really expanding into allowing people to do what's called, you know, room sharing or space sharing or short-term rental, sort of the, the nicer term for it, Um and what we tried to look at is, and we can get more into how we did the, the scoring, but the basic question that we tried to ask was, how easy is it for somebody to engage in short-term rental in this city? And so we took 59 cities in this case. Um, 50 of them are just sort of the, the biggest uh, population centers in the country, and then the others make up a bunch of tourist destinations and other places that had, uh, have had kind of active debates on this issue. Um, and so in answering that fundamental question of how easy is it to engage in short-term rental, you know, we asked a bunch of, of questions about, you know, is it legal? Where is it legal? To what extent is it legal? What kinds of tax collection requirements are there? Licensing requirements? You know, what kinds of enforcement is there? All that sort of stuff. And we, we put it together to try to come up with a comprehensive uh, grade for each one of these cities as to how open they are to these services. And you know, unfortunately, we found the results were uh, were pretty mixed, which you would see if, you know, you look through the paper. It's a, it's kind of a dicey climate at the moment. So what were uh, some of the factors that you saw that were somewhat common across the country that would make a city have a lower score on this uh, study? Well, the big thing is that th- there are many cities that have some sort of uh, restriction, basically. We call them, you know, legal restrictions. Uh, restrictions on where you can engage in short-term rental. Um, so there are a lot of places that have uh, zoning-based restrictions, for example, that, you know, you can only do it in zones 1, 3, 5, and 2, you know, not, but not these other ones, uh, that sort of thing. So there are kind of geographic restrictions like that in a lot of places. Um, another thing that we saw pretty consistently, um, and actually, interestingly, we saw examples on both sides of this coin, there are some cities that uh, either severely restrict or outright ban what are called hosted stays. So the idea of, you know, I live in the metro D.C. area um, of me renting out an additional bedroom in my home uh, for the inauguration when there's going to be a lot of extra people in town. But, you know, me being here, occupying my home uh, and renting out an additional bedroom, that's a hosted stay. Uh, so some places would severely restrict these hosted stays that, justification for that theoretically as well you know you have a lot of extra traffic and uh, you know other kinds of things in a in a community um, and then there are other on the other side of that coin there were a bunch of cities that uh, did the opposite of that that restricted uh, or made outright illegal non-hosted states um, and you know that's sort of your more typical vacation rental you know I own a home in the Outer Banks of North Carolina or something like that, and I rent it out for the parts of the year where I'm not there, um, so I'm not actually physically occupying the home when people are there. So these are the kinds of things that we saw in in a lot of different cities that led to you know pretty significant uh, downgrades, I guess, in scoring. In addition to you know myriad other restrictions, of course, that that get in there as well. Right. Um, I noticed when looking at the map that uh, the Midwest seems pretty favorable towards these services, with the exception of Chicago, like many would expect. Uh, so while doing this study, did you see any trends that kind of stuck out as to uh, what you would um, what you would expect would come up as a, a, a good score, like different regions or anything like that? You know, we were, I think we were certainly on the lookout for trends like that, whether they're 
regional trends, as you suggest, or ideological trends. You know, maybe more conservative cities do better, or or maybe more liberal cities do better. Right. Uh, or even, you know, based on sort of population measures, larger cities, you know, do they generally do better? Uh, those kinds of things. And what's interesting is at least by kind of an initial glance, and we're going to do some more work to dig into this and, and do some kind of subsequent uh, reports on it, hopefully, but there's nothing that jumps out at, at first glance as sort of an obvious trend. You mentioned that the Midwest did reasonably well, and actually that's mostly because a lot of these Midwestern cities, if you look at like Detroit and Cleveland, um, you know, which ended up at an A-, minus. They ended up at an A minus actually sort of by default because they've been silent on this issue, which, you know, from the perspective of somebody who wants to engage in short term rental is actually fine because it means that there's no law in the books that prevents them from doing it. Um, but, you know, there's uh, at the same time, there's no kind of easy way to legally comply with, you know, if there's a tax collection obligation or something like that. And so um, it's a little bit mixed, you know, obviously not not perfect, but people are allowed to, you know, engage in short-term rental in those quote-unquote silent cities. So you had a bunch of those in the Midwest, which is why I think it, that region looks uh, sort of better than it might otherwise. Um, but it was interesting, you know, we didn't find any kind of major ideological trends uh, or, or population trends here. And I think what it, what it indicates is that this is a policy environment that is, as we call it in the paper, very immature uh, that there are a lot of people who are just starting to wrap their heads around the concept of short-term rental and the regulatory challenges, uh, and we haven't really gotten to the point where, where all of the dust has settled here. So who would you say, um, you know, obviously when Uber came out and was, you know, making a big splash, it was obviously the taxi cab community that came out kind of opposed, saying, you know, they're, they're circumventing the system, they don't need to buy these expensive medallions, all these other types of things. Uh, ha- have you seen? Who are the main opponents to the idea of you know opening your house open, renting a room, or your your place? Yeah, in terms of the the kinds of you know lobbying interests that are engaged in uh, you know pushing restrictions on short term rental, the answer is very clearly the hotel industry. Uh, and they have in, you know, city after city been engaged in this kind of hand-to-hand combat of attempting to impose restrictions on short-term rental of various types. And, and they make a lot of the same arguments that the taxi folks do in the ride-sharing world, which is, well, we have to deal with all of these regulations and, and, you know, licensing questions and we have to carry, you know, these types of insurance and have, you know, fire suppression in all these rooms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, in a sense, it, it's understandable why they would, uh, why they would try to advance a perspective like that. But of course, the service that they are fighting against is very different in nature than a hotel. You know, people, uh, who are engaging in short-term rental are not engaging in kind of a purely commercial venture the way a hotel is. Uh, and so it doesn't make sense to have the same kind of regulatory structure that you would apply to a purely commercial venture like a hotel to somebody who's occasionally renting uh, a home or a bedroom through Airbnb or, or VRBO or whatever. Um, so that's the big, I think, kind of lobbying interest. The other thing that we see is a lot of uh, sort of affordable housing advocates and, and you know, neighborhood quality uh, type people that... You, you see these interests that are, are empowered in so many different cities by zoning boards and, and regulations and uh, other kinds of things that make it exceedingly difficult to do anything without the permission and blessing of your many neighbors. Um, and they engage a lot in what I think are, are sort of ultimately misguided and wrong, but anyway, arguments that they say, well, this, this increases traffic, this increases noise, this reduces the availability of affordable housing if people are taking you know, units off of the long-term rental market and putting them into the short-term rental market. Um, so that's where a lot of that opposition comes from. I, I happen to think, and I suspect you two would agree, that most of the arguments that they put forward are not very persuasive um, from, a, you know, from our public policy perspective, but uh, that's obviously the fight that they've been taking to city halls across the country. Right. So now a uh, section of your study, you uh, draw parallels to services like Uber and Lyft, and John kind of alluded to that earlier. Um, why 
at least in your opinion, can you explain why uh, it's so important to defend these peer-to-peer -peer services? Well, the big thing, I mean, listen, people who come at at questions like this from a free market orientation are already going to have kind of a built-in uh, desire to to protect uh, and promote innovation and um, you know there's this kind of this disruption tends to actually be quite good for the economy in the long run uh, as we sort of disrupt these older business models and, and introduce new ways to do business um, but sort of more to the point specifically why things like ride sharing and in this case uh, room or space sharing, short-term rental are important. Is that they? The big thing is that they unlock underutilized or unused capital. Right. Uh, and what that means is, you know, we have just as an example, we have many more bedrooms than we have uh, individuals in many places. Or uh, just an, another example, we've we had uh, I forget the exact statistic, but we put this in a, a previous paper that I wrote with a colleague of mine. Um, the number of, of vehicles that are engaged in transporting only one person at a time. Um, and so we have all this capital that's underutilized. I mean, if you think about yourself, you know, there are probably times in the year where you could theoretically rent out, you know, your bedroom or, a, or a, an additional bedroom or you could, you know, make use of your car, those kinds of things. Um, and what that does is it adds to the capital stock uh, it adds to, you know, economic growth. It adds to that sort of dynamism um, in an easier way than just about anything else. And so um, when you look back in history, the sort of big economic expansions that we have have almost always been tied to uh, big instances of being able to unlock underutilized capital, um, whether that's, you know, uh, African-American and women coming into the, you know, productive workplace, whether that's, uh, you know, liquid stock markets, uh, you know, other kinds of things that have, have made those kinds of advancements before. And that's what short-term rental can do is, is to unlock that capital and, uh, and bring with it that big economic growth dividend. Yeah, I know if uh, the Cubs make the World Series this year, you can bet your life I'm going to rent out my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> that is happening. Um, no, but one of the things that I think goes on, and I know you guys address it, but when I come at these issues, obviously we understand that the hotel industry or the taxi cab industry do have a built, you know, there's regulations that they have to deal with that we don't agree with. You know, the fact that they have to pay all these taxes, we believe the taxes on all these places are too high, those types of things. I think the real argument should be made is that it's not that we want the, you know, these rideshare or uh, housing facilities to go unregulate, you know, to uh, go unregulated. We just we would actually rather see the the people make the arguments that we need to roll back some of the regulations and the taxes on the existing right. hotel market, right? I mean, that's that's would right. show more com competitiveness in the market. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. And and you know, interestingly, so this did not end up in the paper, um, but we collected information about the difference between hotel and lodging tax rates in mm -hmm. all of these cities. Uh, and ordinary sales tax rates, and obviously it, it's no surprise to anyone that uh, hotel and lodging tax rates tend to be dramatically higher uh, than ordinary sales tax rates. And that's really just a, you know, it, it's because cities have for many, many years attempted to effectively export their tax burden. Yep. Uh, you know, so you have visitors from out of town and people who can't vote uh, a given lawmaker out of office that are coming and paying a higher tax rate. And unfortunately for the hotel industry, uh, you know, they're bearing the brunt of having to collect those very high tax rates. And so they have they have a perfectly good argument that the tax burdens that they face are too high. And so you're right about that. Um, well, unfortunately, what they do is they uh, attempt to uh, sort of saddle these short-term rental services with a tremendous amount of additional burden, even beyond just the, the tax collection uh, question because in most places actually they've uh, if you look at it and we went through this in the uh, in the study to some extent pretty much every place actually just applies an equivalent you know tax collection uh, obligation regardless of what kind of uh, rental you're engaging in and so hotels or short-term rentals or others generally will be required to collect the same amount of taxes 
Um, but it's all the other stuff of, you know, are we really going to require somebody who's renting out a bedroom in their home a few times a year uh, to install, you know, commercial fire suppression yeah, right. uh, in a home, which is just, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to have that sort of requirement for somebody who's uh, occasionally engaging in this kind of commerce. Um, and so, yes, there are some basic questions of public policy that are an appropriate realm for public policy to address. Uh, but they're very basic ones. And beyond those very basic ones, uh, you know, I think all of us would agree that we should let market competition decide, you know, what services people use and, and who succeeds and fails and rises and falls. Um, but unfortunately, there have been some folks who have tried to go very much beyond addressing just those basic questions with public policy and and gotten into, you know, just a huge number of dictates that, uh, that make it effectively impossible to engage in this kind of commerce. And uh, obviously, we think that's bad for consumers. Sure. Well, we do have one more question. We, we make sure everything think come, who comes on here has to answer this question. So if, if you, Andrew Moylan, were dictator for the day of the United States of America, since you're a, na- you know, a national think tank, what would be the one public policy that you would put in place? And it can't be like, oh, I want to have 10 more public policies or, you know, it's gotta be something legitimate. <laughs> I wish for more wishes. Like, yeah. No more. Yeah. No, I wish for more wishes. What would be the one public policy you'd put in tomorrow? Oh, wow. <laughs> that's a really good, I only get one. God, yeah, that's only one. I know there's a lot of stuff to fix. Right. And I think it's actually even harder for our groups that are kind of national in scope. You know, right. we talked to, uh, we were talked to, uh, was it Wash Friedman, uh, Friedman foundation out of Washington state. And they said, Oh, right to work. You know, we had a couple of people say, you know, universal school choice, but right. I think it's almost more difficult for a national group. So, yeah, it's it's really hard to say. Uh, I'll I'll keep it relatively general rather than super specific, like right to work, and say that there are a tremendous number of things that uh, currently are debated and kind of litigated at the federal level, which are really more appropriately questions for states and localities and others to deal with. And so there are just a tremendous number of these issues, whether it's education or transportation or other sorts of things where, uh, you know, farm policy. I mean, we, we're, we're constantly having these debates in Washington, D.C., and it doesn't really make sense for us to be having these debates in D.C., given what uh, the nature of the federal government, at least as our founders understood it, uh, was to deal with truly national questions. So if I'm waving a magic wand, uh, my magic wand is to devolve many of those questions to the federal government and to eliminate the role of dictator uh, <laughs> on the way out, to fire myself uh, as soon as I'm finished doing that. So it's like a reinstatement of the Tenth Amendment? <laughs> <laughs> Enforce the yeah, Tenth well, Amendment. I mean, you know, I, I think, I, I, let's, let's be clear, this is not some sort of panacea, right? But, <laughs> right. Uh, we, we have plenty of states and localities that I think come up with pretty dumb answers to some of the biggest <laughs> public policy questions that there are. Um, right. But, I, you know, I had this thought when I was, we, we've worked on, we worked with Heartland on, on reforming agriculture policy. Uh, and we have this, you know, huge system of subsidies. And, and I was in a, in a room where there were a bunch of agriculture interests and others, and they were talking about, you know, what the particular price for this one commodity should be. And, <laughs> uh, you know, setting these price targets in law. And I just thought to myself, this is insane. We are sitting here talking about one commodity from one industry. Uh, trying to establish what a you know a bunch of eggheads in D.C. thinks should, the right price should be, um, and so you know it's it's but one example. Uh, you know there is no silver bullet. There's no single thing that's going to solve all of our problems, but uh, it might be nice to have some of these things dealt with at the appropriate level. All right, excellent. So for our audience members that are particularly interested in the work of R Street or want to check out this particular study, where should they go? So uh, our website is rstreet.org. The letter R Street.org. And uh, the report itself is all up and available on the uh, beautifully designed website for it on its own, uh, which is roomscore.org, so R-O-O-M-S-C-O-R-E dot org. And they can uh, check out the results, see how their cities are doing, and maybe weigh in with their legislators if they need to do a better job. All right, fantastic. Andrew Moylan from the R Street Institute, thank you for being on with us today. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. That was number six.